Verse 5, they said, Lord, increase our faith. Because the truth is, following Jesus requires faith. Whether it's following Jesus with the act of forgiveness, following Jesus with keeping peace when things are chaotic, following Jesus when he's asking you to do something that seems risky and you're like, I don't know if I can do that. What's on the other side of that sacrifice? And, and in all of that, they said, we need more faith. We need more. Have you ever found yourself asking God for more faith? Because you just feel either skeptical, doubtful. You're not sure you can do it. You're not sure how you're going to get through it. That's where these disciples were at. And Jesus said, if you have faith, in verse 6, as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree. And we got some mulberry trees in Oklahoma. And um, yesterday, a couple days ago, I took the boys hiking. Mac turns five today. Happy birthday, Mac, our, our four-year-old, and uh, who's now five. And so we were hiking through the woods, and we came across this mulberry tree. And we were looking for trails all across the Arkansas River. We were just pulling off the side of the road, finding trails. And we come across this mulberry tree. It's huge. It was like four trees in one. And I was thinking about how Jesus said, all it takes is a little bit of faith to speak to this tree to be uprooted, and it will be uprooted and planted into the sea. He said, that tree will obey you. Now, I don't think Jesus was talking to us about actually getting rid of trees, because I'm a tree guy, or getting rid of mountains, because in another uh, book, he says, say to this mountain, be moved, and it will be thrown into the sea. And sometimes people go, I don't think we're like, actually supposed to cast out mountains. But Jesus was talking about the mountains inside of you. He was talking about the spiritual mountains, the spiritual trees of, of generational curses in your family. He was talking about the things in your life that seem impossible. He was talking about the things in your life that seem unhealable, unredeemable, unfixable, unsolvable. See, we serve a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above anything we ask, hope, dream, or imagine. The question is not, can God do the impossible? The question is, will you have the faith to believe that he can? Everybody say, Lord, increase my faith. God, I pray that you would this morning increase our faith. Whatever faith we came in the room with today, Lord, I pray that you would take it up another notch, take it up another level. God, stir our faith today but to believe for supernatural miracles, signs and wonders, greater glory, greater impact. God, that you would be glorified in and through our lives in such a powerful way that the world would know there is a real God who is greater than anything we face. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. So I was on this adventure the other day with the boys, and we were walking through the woods, and I had Mac. He wanted to bring two of his buddies for his birthday. He said, Dad, I just want you to take me on a hike. I want to go in the woods. I was like, okay. So we're going through these woods, and and, uh, and his two older brothers, they were begging him, can we come with you, Mackie? And he was like, you can only come if you're my servants. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know where. Anyways, but kids are just like, you're going to serve me for the day, and then I'll do it. So they agreed to his proposal. They were his servants for the day. So they're walking. They're helping Mac, and he's the boss for the day as, as his birthday. We're going through the woods. Well, one of the boys falls into this puddle of water. And he starts crying and screaming. He's like, I want my mommy. I got to get out of here. And I felt so bad because we were far into the woods. We were probably a mile from my car. And I was thinking, you know, by the time we get back to the car, it, it, and then by the time I'm able to get him to his mommy, like, it's, it's, it's going to take at least an hour. So I start trying to convince him. I'm like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He's like, it's not okay. And I'm trying to help him. And I've been there before. How many of y'all have been there before where you're like, I just want my mommy. I just want to get out of here. Come on. I just, like, I just, I am done. He was like, I'm done. I can't do this, you know. And I've been there before. But then I just encouraged him. I said, hey, I think you could do it. I think we could press through. When we get out of these woods, I'll get you some nice warm clothes. We'll get a fire going. I'll get you some warm food. And he's like, I can wait for that. <laughs> you know, and he's like five years old, sweet little boy, Max friend. And then he starts saying, you know what? I'm a mighty man of God. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, I'm a mighty man of valor. I was like, yes. He's like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can, I can march through these woods, you know. And he was like flexing his muscles. It was so sweet. 
And I told his mom whenever we, you know, we're dropping off the kids back with their parents. And she goes, you know, he goes to Victor Christian School. I was like, yeah. And she goes, and his teacher has him confess scriptures over his mind and heart. So when he was squeezed, his confession came out. Whatever crisis you see, the, the confession comes out of your mouth when you're in a crisis. When you squeeze a lemon, lemon juice comes out. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. Whatever's inside you comes out of you in a crisis. And this boy, in the midst of his adversity, starts speaking life. He starts declaring, I'm going to make it. I'm going to get through this. I've got warm food on the other side of this. You know, he was declaring, my best days are right in front of me. The confession we say at Victory every single week was not written during the best times of my life. It was written during the worst days of my life. I wrote it on a napkin when I was parked outside of our church about 4.50 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon in 2012. And I remember just feeling discouraged, defeated, battling depression. There was about 10 cars in the parking lot. Service starts at 5 p.m. I was like, nobody wants to hear me preach. I don't want to hear me preach. God, you don't want to hear me preach. The best days of victory are behind us. And I was literally talking doubtful, negative, toxic. And I heard the Lord say, change your confession. Change the narrative. Start speaking life. Talk yourself into victory. Literally, because I didn't want to go into victory physically. But I also didn't feel like I was walking into victory mentally or emotionally or spiritually. And the Lord said, change your confession. I pulled out a napkin with tears running down my eyes and I wrote, I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. My heart is open. My mind is ready to receive because God's not finished yet. When I wrote that part, I was like, Lord, I feel like you're finished. I feel like you're done. So I need you to increase my faith. Somebody say, increase my faith. I felt done, but God was not done. God said, you might feel done, but I'm not done. I'm not done with your family, Paul. I'm not done with victory. I'm not done with America. I'm not done with Tulsa. I'm not done with my church. I'm not done with the Darties. I'm not done with your family. I'm not done with your children's children. See, God has a plan even when you feel like you don't have a plan. So I started writing this napkin, and my tears are making the ink spread, and I'm like, my best days. And I wanted to write behind me, but they were in front of me. And the Lord started speaking this to me, started stirring my faith up to believe that he had something greater. My question for you today is, what are you believing God for right now? What are you believing God for that you can't do on your own, that you can't accomplish with your own charisma, your own money, your own last name? What are you believing God for that would take a supernatural act of God? I think God is wanting to stir his church up to dream again. We're watching across the world. Y'all, Elon Musk is dreaming right now, and he's accomplishing his dreams. We're watching Jeff Bezos is dreaming, and he's making billions off of all of us on Amazon purchases online. We're watching liberal agendas dream big to take the next generation of America. How about the church and some people that believe in the word of God and the promises of God and the principles of God start dreaming to take back a generation of the United States of America. See, people are dreaming about taking your kids' minds away from you. There's people on high levels that are literally dreaming of taking the children of our nation away from the church. How about the church start dreaming? To take the children that are captured in darkness and bring them back into a place, just like we saw in that testimony, breaking generational curses. we got to start dreaming on a higher level. See, the enemy wants the church to just sit back and let the darkness come in and take over. And we just got to go, Lord, we just, we just want to survive the next few years. We just want to get through inflation. We don't need to believe God for anything. See, my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He sits above the circle of the earth. He's still on the throne no matter what presidents come through or governments come through or laws are passed. So my faith is not dictated by who's in office. My faith is not dictated by what's going on in our nation. My faith is on a higher level. My faith is in a God who's greater than any president, any leader, any law, any government, any situation, any inflation we're going through. And I hear God up up there saying, dream with me. Walk with me. Believe for greater. I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to give you five ways to increase your faith. By the way, Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says, God has given each of us a measure of faith. Everybody say measure of faith. 
All right, so this is scriptural here. If you're like, I don't know, I think we're all blessed with the same amount of faith. No, no, no. God gives us a measure, and what you do with that measure determines whether it grows or whether it decreases. You go, I just don't know if that's true. No, it's called stewardship. Jesus talked about stewardship in Matthew 25. He said three people were given different talents. One of them did something with their talents, multiplied it, grew it. And, and Jesus said, those who are faithful with the little, everybody say little, become ruler over more. Everybody say more. All right, so if you're faithful with the little, it's the same thing in companies across the world. When you are faithful with your job, when you are good at what you do, the boss notices you. Your supervisor knows we got to give this person more. we got to promote this person. My nephew just got promoted at Quick Trip again. It's his like third promotion in the last two years. Why? Because he's faithful. He's fa- you stay faithful. You stay fruitful. God will continue to make sure you get promoted. What is God's plan for believers? To shrink, to decrease, to not be an influence on the earth, to not bring any glory to God? No, the God that we serve wants believers to be mighty in their generation, to be strong, to do great exploits, to be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I came to preach this morning. God wants you to be a great impact in your generation. God did not put you on earth on accident for an accident. Your parents might have called you an accident, but God says you are here on purpose because you have a purpose. You might feel like you've been labeled good for nothing, useless, worthless, but God labels you as a masterpiece. God said, I created you to do great things. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. He had a plan for you, and it was a good plan. But the measure of faith we're given, we have to do something with that. You're sitting in the room today of someone who used what he had. In 1981, my mom and dad started Victory Church in a car parking lot with an idea, a dream. And this idea was so intense, it was so strong, this vision in their hearts was so big that nothing could stop them. They were so convinced God has called us to start a church that is spirit-empowered, that is going to touch this city and touch the nations of the earth. And it's going to be multicultural. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be all kinds of different uh, people coming through here with all kinds of different pasts. And we're not just going to have church on Sunday. We're going to have school on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. In 1981, they started with this vision. They were incepted with this dream. And today we're sitting in the reality, the manifestation of a vision that started in here. See, they, they, w- listen, you might say, I want, I want greater faith. I want greater faith. You can say it. But what are you doing with it? You got to activate it. You got to increase it. So number one, the first way that we increase our faith is we got to hear it. Everybody say hear it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, when you get the word of God in your heart, it builds faith in your life. Somebody say hear it. Hear it. So today you're going to hear a message of faith. And I'm praying that it's going to plant a seed in your heart, in your mind to believe God for greater. In 2 Kings chapter 2, are you there? 2 Kings chapter 2, there was a man named Elijah, and God told Elijah, today is your last day on earth. What would you do if God told you this is your last day on earth? He said, I'm going to pick you up later in an Uber, no, a chariot. I'm going to drive you. You're going up to heaven today. Um, Literally, Elijah got picked up by a chariot. Like, this is amazing. (laughs) I think sometimes we skip through these Bible stories A chariot from heaven came down through the sky. Just imagine me. A chariot picks up Elijah, takes him off to heaven. And God tells Elijah, it's coming later on this afternoon. So Elijah wakes up that morning, knowing it's his last day on earth. And he's walking. And guess who's right behind him? Elisha. This young boy who had been following Elijah. Juan, I need you to help me for a moment. You're going to be Elisha. I'll be Elijah. Elijah looks at Elisha. He says, stay here. For God has told me to go to Bethel. In other words, stay here. I'm leaving. I'm going to a higher level. You stay here. And Elijah turns around, and Elisha's still following him. He says, listen, I told you to stay there. Elisha says, as surely as you live and as God lives, I will never leave you. Elisha had caught a vision from God. It was like he had heard a sound from God. That he was anointed and appointed and called to do something greater. Somebody say greater. Today, I'm I'm, I'm literally speaking a message that God is speaking to you through this word that you're called to do something greater. God wants you to go great. God wants you to go farther than your parents did. 
We don't serve a backwards God. We don't serve a God who goes, you know what? Your parents went really far. I need you to go backwards. I need you to maintain. No, we serve a God who does exceedingly abundantly above, greater. Jesus said, the works I did, you're going to do an even greater. I don't know if that's scriptural. John 14, verse 12. It is scriptural. Jesus wants you to do greater. Somebody say greater. Elisha had this vision. So he couldn't get rid of him. Elijah keeps on walking. Three times he does this. He says, stay here. I got to go to Jericho. Elisha follows him. Then there were some prophets in the land. I need you guys to be the prophets. They start shouting at Elisha, just sit down. Just stay there. Y'all shout at him. <laughs> Elisha just ignores him. <laughs> Somebody say, talk to the hand. <laughs> Y'all remember that from the 80s? Talk to the hand. Um, all right. But listen, Elisha literally told people to stop. He said, I've, I've got a mission. I, sometimes you need to tell the voices in your life. Some of us are listening to all the wrong voices. We're listening to fear. We're listening to shame. We're listening to labels from other people saying, you can't do that. You're not qualified for that. We know about your past. You're an unqualified person for that. I'm so glad that God does not consult the critics to figure out who he's going to use in the Bible. God uses people like Samson. God uses people like David. God uses people like Gideon and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Noah. And God uses people like Peter. And God uses people like you and me. He uses, like God doesn't look at what the world looks at. The world's like, I don't know if they're qualified. God says, I'm just looking for hearts that are available. I'm just looking for anyone who's willing to take me at my word. So Elisha's following him. And, and finally, he presses through. Sometimes you've got to follow through some stuff that's not easy. He presses through all kinds of obstacles to finally get to this place in verse 9 where Elijah realizes this guy's committed to his vision. This guy's committed to something. I was with a group of pastors in Boston a couple weeks ago that we were meeting with, and they were asking me to tell the story about victory. And they said, we're believing God for buildings. We're believing God um, to have a permanent location in Portland or, or in uh, Los Angeles or in Seattle. And they were sharing with me their vision and what they're believing God for. By the way, I want you to just write that question down in your notes. What am I believing God for? What am I believing God for? And as they were sharing it, they said, tell us the story. I said, Victory was a mobile church for 27 years. You don't realize this. Victory started in 1981, but the building you're sitting in today wasn't finished being built till March 4th, 2007. And you go, well, well, what did you guys do between 81 and 2007? We were mobile. We rented the Maybe Center after we were in a tent and a car parking lot in the early 80s. We rented the Maybe Center from 1985 till 2007. And Oral Roberts did not give a freebie to Billy Joe Darty. He charged Victory $10,000 a week to rent the Maybe Center. We were not getting into that building free. And he said, I want you to stretch your faith, Billy Joe. I want you to know that you got to pay the same thing any band pays to come in here and do a concert. My dad was like, okay. And across the street in 1985, he's looking at a pecan orchard at 7700 South Lewis. And he starts getting this vision. He starts seeing one day we're going to build a church there. One day we're going to have a school there and a college. One day we're going to have a camp victory. One day we're going to have a dream center. He starts getting it in his heart. And he starts believing God for it. He starts getting it in his spirit. And for 27 years, he presses through. And Elijah turns to Elisha and says, what can I do for you? Now that I see you're committed to this. By the way, just because something's taking a long time doesn't mean God's not going to do it. Just because you got to press through a lot of stuff doesn't mean you're on the wrong trail. Just because you go through a lot of adversity doesn't mean you missed God in some way. Sometimes we get weird like that. We're like, there's so much adversity. God must not be in it. No, typically when there's adversity, it's because God is in it. The anointing attracts attacks. So Elisha's walking through all kinds of people convincing him, you need to sit down, you need to give up, you need to stop following this guy, but he doesn't quit. Somebody say, don't quit. Don't quit. You're a mighty man of valor. You're a mighty man of God. You can do this. So Elisha says, back to Elijah, he says, you know the ministry you have? You know the impact you have? You know the miracles you've seen, Elijah? Remember how you called fire down from heaven? 
You remember how you literally brought revival during a season of Jezebel and Ahab and all of that stuff? Elijah's like, yeah, he's like, I want that ministry times two. I want to do what you did, but even greater. Somebody say greater. Now, if you're like a really insecure person, you're like, no. (laughs) But Elijah looks at him. By the way, we should want the next person to do it better than we've done it. Let him take it to the next level. If you're a boss of a business and you're about to hand off the reins, you should hope that the next guy does it better than you times. I hope my kids go further than me times 20. I think the night my dad was passing away in the hospital, I was praying for his resurrection. We were in the room in MD Anderson. I'm holding his hand. It was swollen. And I'm weeping. I'm like, God, bring him back to life. Please, dad, come back to life. Something was happening in the hospital. And you can't talk me out of this. You might think I'm crazy about this, but I felt like there was electrons moving through his body in the hospital. I felt like there was a transference going on. And at the same time, I didn't want it because I wanted him to stay. And I was weeping and I was holding his big hand. And I could feel like some sort of electricity was flowing through his body. And I didn't realize what it was until a year later when my mom said, Paul, I need your help. You're going to be pastoring Saturday nights and... And someday you're going to pastor this church because you're called to do this. I said, I feel called to do it. That night in the hospital, I could feel like a mantle was being passed. By the way, when, you, when God anoints you to do something, he puts a mantle on you. And you have the power to release that. This is why the disciples would lay hands on a new preacher, a new elder, a new pastor. There was, some, there was an anointing to release. It's in the Bible. It's in the New Testament and the Old Testament. When they, when they were getting ready to anoint someone, they would put their hands on them to believe and release some sort of an anointing. So Elisha says, I want what you've got and even greater. That's a pretty bold thing to say to someone who's done something amazing. To say that to someone like Pastor Billy Joe or Oral Roberts or Elijah or your parents who've, who've walked out some great steps and, and yet, I love what Elijah says back to me. He says, you've asked me for a difficult thing. When did we stop asking God for the difficult things? When did we stop asking God for the big things that are beyond our ability? Not just what you can accomplish this year, but something you can't do without God's help. When did we stop believing God for miracles, signs, and wonders? Healings that are beyond scientific a bit like we're going, how did that happen? It had to be God. To increase your faith, you got to hear it. Number two, you got to speak it. You've got to speak out that message of faith. Corinthians says, we believe, therefore we speak. We speak. So Elijah says, you've asked for a difficult thing. You've asked me for a hard thing. Watch the next part. He says, however, if you see me when I'm taken from you, if you see it, You can be it. If you see it in here, I've realized that i got to close my eyes sometimes to see what God sees. Sometimes you can't see it in the natural. Sometimes you got to close your eyes to see with eyes of faith. You can't open your spiritual eyes sometimes until you close your natural eyes. And you got to walk into environments that feel impossible and go, God, if you did it, For them, you can do it for us. If you healed their family, if you broke through for their business, if you anointed that person, you can do it for me. Elijah says, if you can see it, you can be it. If you see it, you'll get it. If you see it, but if you don't see it, you won't get it. If you don't see, you won't be. And from that moment on, when he was taken up, There was a cloak that fell to the ground, and Elisha walked in the anointing. The miracles Elisha did far exceeded what Elijah did. Elisha went on to do powerful, supernatural things that only God would get the glory from. Give him a big hand. Everybody say, hear, speak, see. I want the band to come out of the keys. you got to see it. Now, in Hollywood, they they believe in the power of seeing something and believing in themselves. Like in 1989, Jim Carrey was acting in a show called In Living Color and uh, Fire Marshal Bill. And in in the show, he literally 
writes this in a journal. He says, in 1989, I was barely making any money, surviving, living in an apartment in, in L.A. And he said, I had this dream that one day I'd make $10 million for a movie. So he wrote himself a $10 million check, put it on his mirror, looked at it every day, confessed it. Someday I'm going to make $10 million for a movie. You can have faith in yourself, and that might get you through some doors. You can have faith in yourself. Hollywood, they, they really encourage, like, have faith in yourself, have faith in yourself, have faith in yourself. Faith in yourself will not sustain you for a lifetime. Faith in yourself might get you into some places, but faith in God is what's going to bring glory to God. Faith in God is what's going to bring glory to God through your family, through your finances, through your dreams. So these, you know, he went on to make $10 million for Dumb and Dumber. Who would have thought Dumb and Dumber would have made that? But there's, there's all kinds of actors, Robert Downey Jr., but then they find themselves in rehab. And they go, I made the money, but I lost my soul. What profit is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul in the process? God's plan for your life is not for you to lose your soul. So you can live in a bigger house, drive a nicer car, and have a lot of money. God's plan for your life is that you would be sustainable for the long haul. That you would make an impact for generations to come. Now don't misunderstand the message today. The faith God wants us to walk in is not about us. The faith God wants us to walk in, the faith of this room you're sitting in, a debt-free building, was never about Billy, Joe, and Sharon. It's never about a person here on earth. It's about God bringing the message of Jesus and his love and his hope through you to your family, breaking off addictions, curses, the plans of the enemy. See, Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he'll try to steal your faith. He'll try to kill your hope. He'll try to destroy your family. He'll bring in all kinds of stuff. Y'all, right now, the devil is dreaming big about you. The devil has big dreams for your children, for this nation, for the world. I think it's time that the church starts getting a little bit bigger with our courage to dream big. To say, no, 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 not only am I going to barely survive, I'm going to thrive. And I'm going to lead my family into a life of victory. And my children will be a blessing. And they will inherit the promises of God. We need to start seeing with eyes of faith. My dad used to walk us out on this land and land out in North Tulsa and say, what do you see? What do you see? Oh, I see grass. I see fields. And he'd say, I see a future church. I see a 4,000 seat auditorium. I see marriages being restored, families being reconciled, people getting saved and healed, prodigals coming home. I see people giving their hearts to Jesus, being discipled in the church. I see a school filled with students from kindergarten through 12th grade with computer labs, raising up tomorrow's leaders. I see kids being trained up, making an impact in the media world, in the sports world, in the business world. I see kids becoming great moms and dads as they get old. See, he was seen with eyes of faith. God wants you and I to see with eyes of faith. When I look at my kids, I, I try to just believe that each one of these kids is going to make an impact. When we do baby dedications here on the second Wednesday of each month, I'm praying over each baby and I'm speaking life. I'm prophesying hope over them. You go, well, I just don't know that God wants us to do that. Yes, he does. He gave us all kinds of books called the prophets. Habakkuk, Nahum, Ezekiel, Daniel. He gives us these prophets, Micah. And he says, declare, for I know the plans I have for you, Jeremiah. My plans for you are to give you hope in a future. My plans are not to destroy your family. See, some people have a theology that God sends us bad things to teach us a lesson. Like, like, like God's plans for you is to get sick, to die, to never make it, for your marriage to fall apart, for your kids to fall apart, for all things to go bad, and it's all for the glory of God. No, no. God's plans for you are good. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. Paul the apostle wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, he said, our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, hope, dream, or imagine. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're living in a time right now where people are deconstructing scripture and they're twisting people into a perverted, deceived, doubtful, skeptical, cynical theology. 
that puts God in this place of he doesn't love you, he's not for you, he's against you, he doesn't want to bless you. And I'm telling you, it's so anti-Christ. It's so anti-Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, we serve a good God. We serve a God who has good plans for his kids. He did not call you so that he could just kill you. He did not put you on earth so that you would live an accidental life and never bring any glory to him. Everything that Jesus did was forward movement with faith. It was all about leading the disciples to do greater things, to make a greater impact. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus didn't call his church to be a weak church, barely getting by, barely surviving, barely making an impact in the city. No, Jesus wants his church to be strong in the Lord. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Let the blind say, I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. You got to hear it. You got to speak it. You got to see it. In Matthew 9, verse 29, there was two blind men, and they were calling out for Jesus to heal them. And Jesus said this in the message version. He says, what do you want? They said, we want to see. He says, become what you believe. According to your faith, if you could see it in here, if you could see yourself seen, then open your eyes and let it be according to your faith in here. you got to see it in here before you see it out there. So I was with this group of pastors a couple weeks ago, and I said, what do you believe in God for? They said, we're believing for this. I said, can you see it happening? They said, well, yeah, I want, like, I believe it, but help me in my unbelief. Increase my faith. Tell me the stories of your parents. So I start walking them through moments where our church was just in a, a, a situation where it didn't look like we were going to see the finances come through. And it literally came down to the wire. In the final last few moments, God provided. And I would tell them these stories about how God blessed us with this building over there. Then God blessed us with this. And then how recently God just blessed us with a brand new West Tulsa Dream Center. See, when you're faithful with the measure of faith you're giving you, God continues to bless you and increase you with more. God, what, When God called Abraham to be a blessing. When God blessed Abraham, he said, this blessing is not just for you, Abraham. This blessing is for your descendants. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are So let's just... See, when God blesses you, it's not for you to hoard it to yourself. It's for you to be a blessing to the nations around you. There was a young man who came to our church in 2006, Moved here from uh, Pakistan. And um, he said, I was sitting in church, had no money to my name, barely got into Tulsa, came here to go to ORU, wasn't sure how the money was going to come through, but I had enough money to get here. And he said, in church, I was at the Maybe Center when Victor was renting the Maybe Center. And he said, your dad was up there speaking and shared a testimony about a businessman who God had blessed and increased his business. It looked like their business was going to fail, and then their business thrived, and, and, and they got involved with just really giving and trusting God, and God began to prosper them, and they began to be a blessing and employ more people and help more people in the city of Tulsa and help build the church. And he had just written a check for a vision that your dad had casted, that he had written a pretty large check. And he said, I sat in that room, and I said, one day I'm going to write checks. And he began to say, one day I'm going to write a check for $50,000, $100,000. One day I'm going to write a check that literally funds an entire vision from Victory, for the Dream Center, for mission trips, for feeding programs, for the next church we start, for the next thing we're doing for kids ministry, youth ministry. Someday I'm going to be that guy. He said time went on, went through a lot of hard times, a lot of rocky times. See, this is where people miss it is we think God is a microwave God, but he's a crockpot God. We're, see, he takes his time. Last week, Ashley talked about patience. By faith and patience, our ancestors inherited the promises of God. By faith and patience, Billy Joe and Sharon were a mobile church for 27 years until finally, a year and a half before my dad went to heaven, this building was finished. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't lose your faith. You might lose your job. You might lose your Spouse, you might lose your dog, you might lose your hair, but don't lose your faith. Somebody said, keep the faith. So he met with me recently and he said, Paul, the vision I had 17 years ago is now a reality. He said, when vision pops up in this church, I'm the first one to write that big check. God has been so good to our business. If you can see it, 
if you can believe it. I was reading a testimony from a, young, uh, a family yesterday online, not in this church, in another church, and they said three years ago, something crazy happened to them. They had raised their kids in church, in children's church, in youth, and one day their 14-year-old came home and said, Mom and Dad, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl now. And they said they were very shocked when he said it, and then he said, also, I don't want to live anymore. I hate my life. I want to end my life. And, and he, the mom was sharing this testimony. She said, I've never heard my son talk like this. All of a sudden, he was confused about who he was, and he, he, he was suicidal. And she said, with tears in my eyes, I just looked at him and said, I love you. He said his name. He said, don't call me that. Call me this. And um, that night, she sat with her husband, and they were praying, what do we do? What do we do? And they got a strategy from heaven. They started praying. And they felt in their hearts to, to get him off social media. They said, no more social media. By the way, if you're a parent and kids are still in the house, you're still in charge. The kids are not the CEO of the family. You don't have to let kids run the house. If they're still eating bread off your table, you can still make decisions. Right now, the nation's trying to take away parental authority. And I may be preaching uncomfortable, but I'm going to keep preaching because it's the truth. Like, I've already watched people get up and walk out during this sermon. I'm like, I'm trying to tell myself they're just using the bathroom. But even if they don't like it, listen, here's what I'm trying to say. Here's what I'm trying to say. Mom and dad, Ash and I have five kids. We are outnumbered majorly. And they're always trying to convince us to do what they want to do. At the end of the day, I tell them, who's, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? You are. Okay. Just don't forget that you still have authority. And if you don't use it, you'll lose it. If you don't use your faith, you'll lose it. So they, they, they changed the internet access in their house. They said, hey, we're just going to lean in. We love you. We're just going to walk with you through this. I want you to come with us on some missions trips and hang out with some different people in the church and over a year went by during this phase of life where every day this boy said I just want to kill myself I'm so I don't want to live anymore and um, after a year there was one night where the mom said something changed he came home and he said I know who I am now and he said I want to live and I want to be a mighty man of God this was three years ago he now has his own company 18 years old, he knows who he is, he got his mind back. All I'm saying is this message is not just about, don't limit the message of faith to one category. See, God wants us to walk in faith for our kids, for our marriages, for our families, for your finances. God wants you to have a measure, like God wants us to believe it, to hear this message of faith and go, okay, God brought that girl back, God healed that family, God did that for them. This person was believing for a house. They find, this person was believing for a college scholarship. If I told you the testimonies represented in this room, you, I mean, we don't have enough books to fill the testimonies in this room of God providing, God protecting, God delivering, God redeeming, God saving. If God did it for them, he can do it for you. Everybody say, hear it, speak it, see it, believe it. Believe it. Number four, believe it believe it we've got to believe that God can do the impossible Jesus said if you have faith as small as a mustard seed you can say to this tree be thrown into the sea there was a man who was serving in Napoleon Bonaparte's army and he has been conquering the the world and legend tells this story over hundreds of years ago that he was visiting his troops in different places and and one of the troops grabbed his hand as he was shaking hands and said, Sir, he said, yes. He said, may I have the island of Malta? The captain was ready to shoot the troop. (laughs) The captain was like, how dare you ask Napoleon this? You know, the leader of the world. And Napoleon said, granted, Malta is yours. The captain pulled him to the side. He said, why did you just give that troop, a nobody, an entire island? He said, because he had the audacity to ask me for it. He had the courage to ask me for it. There was a man in the Bible named Jabez. His mom named him Jabez, which meant pain. Because in the moment he was born, all he did was cause her pain. 
Never name your future based off your present circumstances. Never let a present pain become a permanent vision in your life. This woman was consumed with pain and misery, so she named her son Misery, Pain, Jabez. All you'll ever be is a pain in my life. That's literally what she, she, she prophesied over her future based on her present circumstance. But the day came where Jabez got old enough to recognize I don't have to wear the labels that other people put on me. I don't have to carry the labels that people have placed on me. So the day came where Jabez prayed a prayer in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And he said, oh Lord, I pray that you would bless me. This is where we get this in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, the blessing of God. Galatians 3.29 says we are heirs to the covenant and the promise that God gave to Abraham. The same blessing that God gave Abraham, he wants to give you. The same blessing that God gave Jabez that day, God wants to give you. Jabez said, Lord, I pray that you would bless me. Lord, I pray that you would enlarge my territory. See, Jabez got a vision for greater, and he could not stay in the same place that he had been in his whole life. Once you get a vision for greater, once you get a taste for greater, once you start believing God can do something greater than what I'm seeing right now, you can't just stay where you're at. You start believing it. You start speaking it. You start seeing it. And he started declaring, Lord, I pray that you would bless me. I pray that you would enlarge my territory. God, I pray, Lord, that you would shine upon me, that you would get the glory through me. God, I pray, Lord, that you would cause me to no longer bring pain wherever I go, but Lord, that I would be a blessing to the people around me. You can begin to change your confession. You can change your prayer. You can change your life when you invite God to get involved in it. Hearing, speaking, seeing, believing. Number five, you got to walk it out. You don't get muscles by just talking about the gym. The gym is great. I'm getting stronger. I see people going into the gym. They're working out. It makes me stronger. No, them working out doesn't make you stronger. You can watch other people work out. You can look in the mirror. You can talk about it. But until you get underneath that bench press and you take that bar off the rack and you begin to push and you begin to flex And you begin to work and you say, put another 45 on there. Give me another barbell after this. I'm going to do another set. I'm going to do another rep. I'm going to keep on working these muscles until I begin to see a change in my body. Until I begin to see a change when I look in the mirror. See, faith will never grow until you start walking it out. A lot of people want their faith to increase, but they're not walking it out. And here's my challenge for us today. Begin to activate what God has asked you to do. Take a step of faith. Wherever you need to see a miracle, take a step of faith. Believe for it. Believe for it. What does that look like for you? What are you believing God for? Some of you are believing for victory in a certain area. Take a step of faith. God will show you what that step of faith looks like. It might be signing up for counseling. It might be signing up for discipleship class. It might be sowing seed in a certain area. It might be beginning to do something new and fresh, starting a new habit, ending a habit you need to end. Whatever that step of faith is, don't put it off for tomorrow. Don't procrastinate about it till the end of the year. Right now, this is the season. This is the time. 2023, God wants the church to start dreaming and living on a higher level of faith. I want you to stand your feet all over this place I'm going to invite those of you in the room today that need your faith to increase you need to see God strengthen your faith maybe you've felt like you've been wavering a little bit maybe you've just felt tired in the way maybe you've just felt a little discouraged or unintentionally complacent where you go man I haven't been stretching my faith like I need to I haven't been dreaming on the same level Maybe you're in the middle of something. You go, Paul, I I have faith for this. I am believing God for this. But at the same time, the enemy has whispered so many lies of, of unbelief, of fear, of doubt, of shame, of feeling unqualified, feeling unworthy, feeling like I'm not the right guy, feeling like I've made too many mistakes for God to use me. Every character God used in the Bible made plenty of mistakes, had plenty of issues, and God still used them. God wasn't looking for perfect people. He was just looking for available people, people that would take him at his word. If you're here today and you just say, Lord, increase my faith.
for whatever that is, I want you to leave your seat. Come and find a place at this altar. If you're believing God for something, you need a miracle in your life, just come and find a place at this altar. If you want to see breakthrough in a certain area, you want to see God do something beyond your ability, beyond what you could do, you want to see God show up in ways that he gets the glory in and through your life, I want you to just come to the altar. We're going to sing a worship song. If you're here today and you're not right with God, you need to surrender your heart to Jesus, come and join us at this altar. If you need to repent of sin, come and join us at this altar. If you need healing in your body, come and join us at this altar. We're just going to make this an altar of surrender, of trust in God. Let's sing this to the Lord. Just begin to release your faith to say, God, you are more than able. You are more than able. do the impossible he can open up the barren womb he can open up blind eyes he can make the lame to walk healing in Jesus faith in Jesus more in Jesus God increase our faith increase our faith he's gonna move God wants me to tell this story and I don't know why but back when we were building this building the Lord really pressed on my dad's heart to believe God that we would have a, a really amazing kids area 
uh, for our children's church and for the nursery and, and all this area back here. And when we were in the process of it, he got this vision, this idea that God wanted us to have a carousel in our church. People kind of laughed at him. Pastors were like, Billy Joe, churches don't have carousels. Woodland Hills Mall has carousels. Promenade Mall, you know, whatever mall. But churches don't have, Disney has carousels. But churches don't have carousels. And he goes, well, I, I think God wants us to have a carousel. And so the day came where the carousel was put in the children's church area. If you didn't know, we've got a carousel over there. It works. And uh, the paint's all on there. No chipped paint on the horses. That was a big deal to my dad. I remember getting on that carousel. My dad was laughing, smiling on the carousel. We're riding the horses. We're all grown-ups. This was like we weren't kids anymore. We're all adults. And he's like, don't you love it? But I could see what he saw. He wanted my kids, his grandkids, that he didn't get to see all of them. He got to see Isaac and Lizzie. But he didn't get to see all his grandkids. He had this vision that one day little kids would come in church and they'd go, church is fun. There's a carousel in here. This place is awesome. And he saw a vision for the next generation. I think some of you, God's given you a vision and it's, it's not really about you. It's about people after you. That God wants you to believe and not be afraid to ask even for the things that might seem silly to the world or little to the world. And God says, I, I know the desires of your heart. God puts little desires in our heart. He puts plans and, and he puts little dreams in our heart. And God wants to see those dreams come to pass. Some of you had a dream for the thing you're doing today and you're walking in the fulfillment of that dream. Praise God. But God says, there's even more I wanna do in you and through you. If there's breath in your lungs, God's not done dreaming about your purpose and your plan. God's not done with your life and your family and your future. There was... A girl recently who said, I, you know, I was believing God for um, transportation. Do you think God cares about your transportation? Yes. If it matters to you and you can use it to be a blessing, it matters to God. Don't let anyone talk you out of that. And so anyways, God provided for her. She's now driving a new car and it's great. And she said, I'm able to be a blessing, give other people rides to church. I was talking with a couple right before we walked into this service. They said, we heard a testimony of a, a couple who had been believing God for a house and weren't sure if they would ever get one, and they got one, and, and the spirit of Christ is the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Christ. And they said, we took hold of that testimony and said, Lord, if you did it for them, would you do it for us? And they just shared with me that they just got a house, and they've been believing God. They, they thought they'd never get that house. They got the house. See, God cares about the dreams that he puts in your heart some of you have a dream to get married some of you have a dream to have children and the doctors have said it's impossible you can't do that that'll never happen for you why not believe God why not get your hopes in the Lord the world says don't get your hopes up you'll be disappointed but all throughout the word of God it says put your hope in the Lord put your trust in the Lord have faith in God have faith that he can do the impossible things so I want to follow the word of God, not the word of the world. I want to follow God's opinion, not man's opinion. I want to believe that God's able to do what doctors might say is impossible. I'd rather go to the grave believing God for the impossible than die with dreams in my heart because I never believed God could do it in me or through me. So Lord, I pray for a spirit of faith to rise up in the room today. For every person in the room that's believing God for the supernatural God, I pray, Lord, that you would begin to stir in them faith. Lord, even today as they were hearing the message, I pray, God, that you would just build another brick, God, on that wall of faith. I pray that you would just continue to add and strengthen, God, the faith that they had when they walked in the room to believe for greater, to believe, God, that you can still do the impossible, to believe that you can still multiply the loaves and the fishes. God, to believe that you can still show up, God, from the north, south, east, and west and do things that, God, bring glory to you through us. God, I pray, Lord, for every person that's just been walking through just a season of barely surviving. God, I thank you that you would begin to take them into a season of thriving. God, that they would begin to see favor. God, favor. Your goodness and your mercy follow us all the days of our life. God, I thank you that you're a good shepherd. God, that you are a faithful God. 
that I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're meeting needs. You are Jehovah Jireh. Just say this with me. Jesus, I surrender. I trust in you. My faith is in you. Not in myself, not in the government, not in the president. My faith is in you. My hope is in you. My trust is in you. I thank you, Lord, that you are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what I could ask or even imagine. So God, I trust in you. All things are possible. You are a good God. Your plans for my life are not evil. You are not an evil God. You are a good God. You are for me, not against me. So I put my faith in your word, in your love, in your character. I thank you, Jesus, that victory is in my future. My best days are not behind me. They're right in front of me. And I will give you glory. In Jesus' name.